Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our SpedNet Wilton webinar, The Elephant in the Room, Navigating the Minefield of Sexuality for Kids with Special Needs. And from personal experience, it is indeed a minefield and a very difficult topic to address with our kids, but it's very necessary in order to protect our children and to protect their safety and well-being. Dr. Eckert is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in autism spectrum disorders. For more information on Dr. Eckert, you can check out our website at www spednetwilton.org or our Facebook page. And all the information from today's webinar, including Dr. Eckert's PowerPoint, will be uploaded to the SpedNet Wilton website and also to our Facebook page. Our moderators today are Eve Kessler, founder of SpedNet Wilton, co-president of SpedNet Wilton, Carolina Corrigan, and I am Janine Kelly. Just a few ground rules before we get started. Please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A. Please don't type questions into the chat because they're hard to keep track of. We'll do our best to answer the questions at the end of the presentation in the order that they're received. Also, more importantly, be mindful that this is an open forum that's being recorded and we can't guarantee confidentiality. So you may not want to reveal any personal information in your questions. Also, lastly, any information provided in this webinar by Dr. Eckert or the moderators is not intended to be legal or therapeutic advice. The information content and materials are for general purposes only. And with that being said, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Eckert. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Good. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you. I, I appreciate your bravery in coming to see something uh, that's such a difficult topic for so many people. During the presentation, I will be asking some questions basically with yes or no answers. For those, please put it in the chat if you want to say yes or no. Otherwise, uh, the questions go in the Q&A as, as you were just told. So let's begin. The elephant in the room, navigating the minefield of sexuality with special needs children. I think that um, there are some reasons why we would want this particular talk to address our children particularly, and I'll be getting to that. So what do we mean by a sexuality? And I'll give you a hint. It's not just sex. Sexuality is a huge part of how people define us. Just think either with that sonogram or with the births, the first thing they say is it's a girl, it's a boy. And based on that, people might dress you in pink or in blue or in something along that line. They name you according to that. The room that you're in might um, be decorated according to that. People are giving toys or people are having all kinds of expectations based on gender. What are girls supposed to do? What are girls supposed to be like? What are girls supposed to supposed to um, prefer and what are boys supposed to be like? What are boys supposed to do? What are boys supposed to you know, prefer? And so sexuality very much gives our kids the uh, message of what's normal. So that a girl who is say preferring not to, uh, not to do what the girls do but maybe to play sports gets called a tomboy and a boy who isn't stoic, a boy who cries, might be called a sissy, he might be called a girl. So sexuality is a huge part of our life. It's how we feel about ourselves, it's part of how we define ourselves. So you might be wondering at this point, so how do I talk about sexuality? I've always thought about talking about sexuality as having to talk about sex. What age do I start? And is this a good thing for my child to hear about? And what do I know? How do I say it? Welcome, everyone, and thanks for coming. I know it's tough for parents to get out sometimes. No matter. Nothing gets in my way when it comes to helping my kids. To be honest, I didn't exactly choose to be here. I mean, what does sex have to do with our three-year-old? I didn't learn about this stuff until middle school, and that was fine with my parents. A lot of us, including me, had that kind of experience as kids. What do the rest of you think? My parents were like brads, but I think they might have been wrong. 
I can already see that our two-year-old is curious about her body. It's pretty funny. And isn't it better they learn from us rather than other kids who only think they know what they're talking about because their parents don't talk to them either? My nine-year-old's friend actually told her just last week that girls eat their tampons. She saw it on YouTube. Okay, but still, how do you know the right thing to say? If you get it wrong or if it's too much too soon, couldn't that be harmful? For many generations, adults thought that shielding kids from learning about sexuality was the safe thing to do. The truth is, better educated kids are way more likely to make better decisions as they grow up about everything, including sexuality. But with sexuality, there's still a double standard that says knowledge could be harmful. I know you're right, but I'm so embarrassed by the words I'd have to say. And isn't it better for moms to talk to daughters and dads to talk to boys? Children, especially young children, look to grown-ups for information simply because we're trusted adults, regardless of characteristics like gender. And one of the best things we can do is give the message that everybody can talk and learn from each other about this subject. I get it, but I still don't know if I can say the word penis in front of my kid. Embarrassment is one of those catchy feelings, and most of us caught embarrassment about sexual things from people around us when we were very young. So we never get to find out that these words are just words, and that it's really healthy and okay to say them out loud. You're right. Why should I be embarrassed to say testicles or erections? Nipples? Masturbation. Vulva. Clitoris. Ejaculation. Scrotum. Vagina. Penis! <laughs> <laughs> Good job, everyone. And with a little practice, like, try repeating these words to yourself in front of a mirror this week. I think you'll be ready. In case you're, uh, experiencing the fear that those parents talked about and have a hard time imagining practicing saying penis in front of a mirror, I just encourage you to think about it and to think about how, um, how important it is that we address the fear and the discomfort that we learned as kids. And the good news is there's books and there's videos that will help you. I'm going to be pointing out a lot of these as, as we go through this. But amaze.org is a great site for the kind of video I just showed you, talking for either for your benefit about how do you talk to kids, giving you an idea of what to talk about. And sometimes there are some that you might look at with your kids. These are on... Um, these are on YouTube, but there also is a site called amaze.kids or amaze.org. So what you might be thinking right now, you might be thinking, I, there's just too much I'm doing, okay? I'm having to deal with IEPs and, P and PT and OT and getting homework done and all of the logistics. And this is just going to be overwhelming. My child has too much to do. And besides, they're not interested, right? They're not asking. But the reality is this isn't work. The whole point of this talk is that this isn't the talk. This isn't a series of lectures. That what we're aiming for is at creating an open door so there'll be an ongoing conversation about sexuality throughout their growing up. And I want you to put in the chat right now, how many of you felt you had an open door to talk about sexuality with your parents? If you felt it was open, say yes. If you didn't, say no. Any responses? Yeah, so we have many more no's than yeses. Right. And do you feel yes or no that that really was helpful to you? Yes, if you think that was a better way to do it, and no, if actually you don't. So mostly no's and a couple of yeses. Okay. So obviously we're, we are, we are different, but um, I want to give you a sense of why I've, I personally feel this conversation is so important and why I'm asking you to at least 
try to have open minds as we talk about this. The, the fact is our kids are already labeled different and they're called special needs and they might be LD, they might be ADHD, they might be NLD, they might be autistic, they might have sensory issues. I'm not going to go through the whole list of everything that everybody's called, but this is what we call neurodiversity. Our kids learn or our kids process differently and there's nothing bad about that. They actually, there are gifts that come along with the differences, but often the, our kids' peers make them feel that different is bad. And that's a sense that our kids carry. So the most important thing that we can do is to make them understand that other parts of their lives are normal, that asking questions is normal, that wondering is normal, that wanting information is normal. And even going through periods where you have different ideas about yourself is normal. So what do they need to learn when they're very young? Well, the first thing they need to learn is about their bodies. And when I'm talking about their bodies, I mean the right words, because when we if we can't even talk about the words like the people in the video said, we're giving them a message that there's something different, there's something bad about that. So if we call it pee pee or poo poo or down there, then the message is this is unmentionable. And whereas we use the right words, if we can say penis, if we can say vulva, if we can say vagina, we're giving them the idea. These are parts of your body. They're special parts of your body but they are parts of your body, just the same as your nose and your ears and your chin. A second thing that's really important for them to learn though, is the difference between private and public space. Private space, the most private space is your bedroom. Private space is also your home. Semi-private space might be the doctor's office and might be, say, the locker room at school. And public space is the classroom. Public space is pretty much everywhere else. So what's private and public behavior? So something like masturbation is private behavior that perhaps you only do in your bedroom. You don't even do it in the private space of your house. Whereas talking about sexual questions is something you might be able to do with your parents in your house, but you might not do it with a friend even in your house. And if you're in a different context, when the public, you might not do this at all. And private language, what is private language? Well, talking about sexual questions, talking about ideas, your parts, those are something that you can do in private with your parents, but maybe in private, we still don't talk to our friends about it. And certainly in public, we don't talk about our uh, sexual questions or sexual issues. So even if your class is having a discussion about different parts of their body and growing up and the fact that they're taller, it's not a good, okay place to say that you're getting pubic hair. So, uh, Actually, when you think about our kids, a lot of this is actually quite nuanced, depending on context, depending on content. So this is something that actually takes some discussion. So I use visuals a lot. I have a whiteboard in my office and I often draw out diagrams to give our kids a sense because so much of this is, seems intangible when, when we're talking about this. So this is a diagram that's often used talking about boundaries. And as you can see, you can have family in the middle and you can talk very clearly here about family. You can also put names in as to who's in my family, who are the ones that I could have those kinds of talks with, as opposed to there might be a circle between family and friends of family that you might not have this talk with. And then there's friends and what can you say to a friend? And I find many times our kids are confused about who are their friends. I've had kids say, everybody in my class is my friend in which case it helps to put names in the different circles, or they may say, nobody is my friend. So this can be a really helpful tool to help them define both the relationships they're having with people and also what kind of space and what kind of things are appropriate and not appropriate to do. 
So an important thing to remember about our kids is that even though they may have uneven development in different realms, even though they may be socially or emotionally behind their peers, their bodies and their feelings are maturing on schedule. So just because our kids seem a couple years younger than their peers in many ways, their bodies aren't. And that's why these conversations are important for us to have. From the time our kids are very young, they need to understand the idea of consent. They are the ones who are in charge of their bodies. Oh, sorry. There we go. Consent for kids. This is you. Okay, it doesn't look exactly like you, but let's say it's you. This is your body, and you get to decide what you do with your body. No one else is entitled to tell you what to do with your body. Not your friends, not strangers, not adults you know. No one is entitled to decide what you do with your body, except you. That's called bodily autonomy, by the way. And that's what consent is all about. Everyone is different. Some people love to hug, and some people hate hugs. And each person gets to decide what they're comfortable with. Can a hug-loving person just start hugging someone at random? Nope. They need consent. How do people know if they have consent? They ask. Would you like a hug? Yes, I would. Can I hold your hand? I'd rather not. Okay. If a person doesn't say yes. Can I hug you? Um, I, uh, then they haven't given their consent. It's really pretty simple. Ask for consent. Listen to the answer. By the way. If a person bribes someone or threatens someone to say yes, that's not consent. Sometimes adults will try to tell a kid what to do with their body. Go kiss Aunt Doris goodbye. But the kid still gets to decide. No thanks, that makes me uncomfortable. I'll just wave goodbye. Some things kids can't consent to. They can't enter into legal contracts. They can't vote. And they can't consent to sexual stuff, because they're kids. So if an adult does something that kids can't consent to, that's not okay. The adult is wrong, and it's not the kid's fault. And that's when it's most important to tell a trusted adult, like a teacher. Why? Because it's your body. And no one else is entitled to tell you what to do with it. Practice consent. I want you all to think for a second about something that was said in there. Do we model respecting kids' boundaries and do we teach them that they owe physical contact like hugs to the people who love them? Remember in that, in that video, it said, if Aunt Doris wants a hug and a kiss, the child has bodily autonomy. How do you feel about it? If there, if you're at a family gathering and an aunt, aunt Doris or even grandma wants a hug and your child doesn't feel like a hug, is it right to insist that they have it? Or do we teach them that they have the right to say no? If you think it's right to insist, say yes. If you think no, they should be asked and they should be required to hug whoever we want them to hug, say no. So yes, if they can say no. How are we doing? So it's pretty even, I would say, yeses and nos. Yeah, it's a very complicated question and that's why I'm inviting you to think about it because I'm grandma. And when my granddaughter leaves, if I say, can I have a hug goodbye? I kind of want a hug goodbye, 
But on the other hand, if we teach our children that you owe hugs to people who love you, what happens when they're a little older and someone says, well, I love you, so you really should do this with me. It's, it's worth thinking about, okay? Because we're modeling what they're going to be learning and understanding as they get older. So now I come to the happy topic of puberty. When do we start talking about puberty? Well, I think one of the things that's important is our kids are already sensitive to being different. And around puberty is the time when the kids are most different physically in maturation and the least tolerant of differences. It's, kids will even pick on you if you have bigger feet. And so I think it's important to understand that what's necessary is to help our kids feel normal. Now, I will say most of these things are about girls. That's only because the ones about boys were longer. There are videos just like this for boys. Are you normal? Girls and puberty. What is normal? Lots of kids wanna be normal. You might think that normal means that everybody is the same. But when it comes to puberty and growing up, there is more than one kind of normal. Doctors call it the wide range of normal. So it can be normal for one girl to begin breast development and want a bra at age eight. But another girl can start breast development as late as her 14th birthday and still be considered normal. And it's also normal for lots of girls to want bras because their friends are wearing them especially when girls have to change together, like in the school locker room. There may be other girls, developing or not, who don't want to wear bras. They just don't like them. So the body changes of puberty, developing breasts, underarm and pubic hair, hips that get wider, can start happening for girls as young as age eight or as old as age 14. A first period, also called menstruation, will happen for many girls around age 12 but it can happen as young as nine or as late as a girl's 16th birthday and still be considered normal. That means a girl can get her first period when she's as young as a third grader or as old as a 10th grader. Girls who start puberty when they're younger may feel embarrassed that they are the first among their friends to need a bra and get their periods. But girls who develop later may feel worried and embarrassed that they are growing more slowly and wish puberty would speed up. Which one are you? We're all together and the wide range of normal. So children who have difficulty with change are going to really need to have clear expectations. What's going to happen to their bodies and feelings and what's normal? Normal, as you just saw, has enormous variation and the same thing is true for boys. I'm sure if you have or you've seen boys who are in about seventh grade, some of them look like little kids and some of them look like teenagers and girls do mature sooner than boys. So puberty, oh my God, look at this list. Bodies, feelings, relationships, everything from pimples to sensory issues to clothes and all of the what ifs. Because if we have kids who are a little bit socially isolated, or if they're embarrassed about the idea of being different, then they may not have information for what do you do if you get your period at school? What do you do if you have an erection at recess and you're hideously embarrassed? And so as things come up, we have to be able to help our kids anticipate and understand these issues. And sometimes these things come up when we're watching TV or when we're talking about something that happened at school. So this isn't a lecture about, okay, here's what you do and this and this and this. This is something that comes up kind of organically in conversation and certainly not all at once. But we have to find ways of helping our kids 
learn about these kinds of things because all of you know that when you go through puberty, not only does your body have a lot of change, but there's a lot of change in all these other areas. Do we tend to have unconscious expectations of our kids? Yes. We might assume because they are emotionally or, or, um, or um, in other ways immature that they're asexual. They don't think about sex. Or we might assume that they're heterosexual and they don't have to know about all this stuff and we don't have to deal with it. But Unfortunately, our kids are going to be exposed to today's world. The kids around them are going to be talking about different things. They're going to be uh, doing different things. They're going to be identifying in different ways. And naivete can leave our kids vulnerable to being embarrassed if they don't know what a word means. It can be, lead them to be uh, manipulated by somebody who is um, ha, you know, trying to get them to do something. And it can be, leave them certainly vulnerable to being teased if they, um, if they don't know what a word means or if they are um, using something inappropriate. I had a, 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 young, a boy I was teaching and, or I'm working with, and the other boys, and this was about seventh grade, were all using a slang term for a woman's vagina. Uh, and it begins with C. So I'll let you imagine what that might be. And they were referring to a girl when they were mad at her as being that word. And my client had absolutely no idea what that word meant. And so he was mad at a teacher and he called her that word. I'm sure you can imagine her reaction. And ultimately she realized that he had no idea what she was talking about. But it's, um, it's important that our kids be educated and they, I'm not saying we give them a long list of all of these words, but again, if you're watching TV, if you're, if you're um, in some ways, this sort of thing comes up, we want to them to understand what's going on. And I'd like to read something to you. Um, it came from that great source of information, Facebook. Uh, my nine-year-old daughter asked me, what does LGBTQ mean? And before I could answer, my mom, her grandma said, she doesn't need to know about that. And I told my daughter, L is for lesbian, which means a romantic love between two women. The G is for gay, which is romantic love between two men. The B is for bi, where someone has romantic love for more than one kind of person. Q is for questioning or queer, when the person is maybe understands that they're not hetero, but they don't know what they are. And T is when someone goes from one kind of gender to another, because that feels true to them. And so all of this is really about love and how people find love in the world and how people love themselves. And my daughter said, I get it, that's really beautiful. When we think about these things, we tend to think about sex, but I think it's really helpful to open our minds to a different way of even thinking about this. The language we use is incredibly important. We need to be sensitive to shaming. And I am sad to say that many of our kids, because they're seen as different, because they're seen as neurodiverse, even though neurodiversity is normal and they often have gifts that come with their challenges, they have a sense of shame that there's something wrong with them and that they're not as good as other kids. We don't want to add to that. We want them to understand that wondering is normal. Asking questions is normal. Even having exploration or thinking about different kinds of things is normal. And they're going to be running into everything I'm describing in the world that they're in right now. If we look at this, which is called gingerbread person, 
you can see that the anatomical sex is the sex that they're born with. And this can be generally male or female. Occasionally there are children who are born with ambiguous or um, with ambiguous sexuality. But for the most part, they're born boys or girls. Identity is something that I de develops over a, a number of years. And that's how they feel inside, how they feel uh, good about themselves. Attraction is who they're attracted to. So they might be attracted to people who are, they, who are of the opposite gender, or they may have other attractions, but it's separate from identity, separate from sex. And expression is how you, how you appear, how you dress, how you um, manifest yourself in public. So you might have a girl who feels very girly but has sensory issues. So she wears uh, sweatshirts and baggies and, and sweatpants because that's what's comfortable for her. But that's not seen as typical girl expression. So birth gender isn't necessarily the same as sexual identity, which isn't necessarily the same as gender expression, which isn't necessarily the same as gender attraction. And I realize this is very complicated. It's very complicated for our kids, and, but they're going to run into it. And that's something that's a fact of life right now. And so we never grew up with this. When I grew up, there were two kinds of sex identification. You were male or you were female. Never, ever did I dream that there'd be driver's license that had non-binary on it. So we have to help our kids understand the world that they're going into. So gender identity is the internal perception of one's gender. And there's a lot of things people can be. A gender where they don't identify with one, bi gender where they identify as more than one, cisgender, which is what we call straight, gender fluid, which is where they feel they have sort of mixed qualities. All of, the, all of these things are part of the world our kids are gonna run into. And I'm sure many of you are aware when you see people's emails or when you see their stationery, that it's becoming much more normal for people to use gender pronouns. So you'll see something that's signed with the person's name and it will say, she, her, hers but it might also say they, them, theirs. And it may be very confusing to us why one person would be them. And I understand that it's confusing to me, but people take very seriously respecting gender pronouns. And I think even though we may feel that this is totally foreign to us, it's something again in the world that we're running into and our kids are gonna run into and that they're going to need to understand that other, other kids, other people are going to expect respect for who they feel they are. Gender attraction, again, there's many different way, uh, kinds of gender attraction. And these are some of the words that they're going to run into. Asexual is pretty obvious. Gray asexual is where somebody is very rarely feeling sexual attraction. Demisexual is only being attracted when you're in the context of an emotional relationship. And then uh, these other ones may be familiar to you. I'm going to give you a resource where if you wanna learn about these, you can. We encourage, but what we wanna do is encourage our kids to come to us with questions. Sophie, I want you to know I'm really proud of you for coming to me the other day when you had trouble setting boundaries with Taylor. Yeah, Liam said that I should. That's great. I've helped your brother before with some of his problems too. Yeah, that's what he said. And I'm really happy I talked to you. I was a little nervous because I thought that if I talked to you, I might make it worse or get in trouble. I understand, Soph. You know, I worried about the same things when I was your age and I had to talk to my parents. But it's important to talk to someone when you feel like you can't handle a situation. 
I know sometimes grownups feel really weird and old and like we don't get it, but I dealt with a lot of the same things that you are when I was your age. <laughs> I even deal with some of those things now. Really? You, you seem like you'd never need help with stuff like that. Everyone needs help with these things sometimes. Having a little help can make a hard situation a lot easier. Whether it's just getting a little emotional support or maybe a tip or even having someone step in to help you. Yeah. What you said about Taylor helped. She even said sorry after. I'm glad it helped. You can always come to me whenever you have a problem that you can't deal with. And if you don't want to talk to me, you can always go to Mr. Sierra or to your father. Yeah. I talked with dad about that time in gym class when. This is a site that has, um, it's, it's, it's really being developed now. They're getting more grants that actually has um, videos of parents talking to their children, not just cartoons. And it can be a really helpful site. It's, uh, you can see the uh, link right there, diffusioninc.com skill flicks. And it's ba it's the whole purpose is to help parents develop skills in talking to their kids. And I'm, it's going to be at the end of the talk, where you'll have all the resources. But again, children need a trusted adult that they can turn to for help. They may get misinformation from peers. They may get confused from peers. They may be manipulated by peers who are giving them misinformation. If you are not comfortable being the one to talk to your child, then perhaps somebody else is the person you would suggest, perhaps a teacher, perhaps another family member. But it's important the child knows it's okay to ask. It's okay to wonder. It's okay to try to figure out how to navigate all of this stuff that they're running into. Because our kids already do have commu possibly communication deficits, possibly social deficits, and they have a desire because they're often labeled different to be accepted. And because they have a desire to be accepted. It's especially important that they be educated about what's appropriate, about consent, about bodies, and about what might be an inappropriate or a dangerous behavior or negative intentions. They have to know that no matter what situation they're in, they have the right of consent and they need to know they can look for help if they need it. This is why this whole talk is about safety as well as learning about yourself and about relationships and about feelings. Sex Ed for Self Advocates is an incredible site. I, it's by the Organization for Autism Research. And you might wonder why I put up something that seems specific for autism. Well, autistic kids have exactly the same sexual feelings and the same sexual development as every other kid. What's different about autistic kids is simply that they need very clear, direct explanations. Well, I don't think there's anything about clear and direct explanations that's bad for any kid. So this is a really terrific site and it's designed to be read by teenagers so that this is something where you can share something with your teenager and either have the teenager watch it or, or read it actually, or read it together or have them read it and talk to you afterwards. There's also a section for parents so that you can um, go on yourself and read about all these things because I'm not going into all of these things in great detail. I want, we all need to learn about it. I had to learn about it. I, you might not be able to see it, but here is a stack of books that I had to read in order to give this talk. 
So they have sections on private and public, puberty, relationships, sexual orientation, sexual activity. Our kids might wonder if I'm ready, we might not think they are, but they might be wondering on their own. So all of these things are covered and this is a really important link. Safety, again, they need to know about safe behavior both their own behavior in terms of what's safe and what's not safe and reading other people's behavior as to what's safe and what's not safe. They may not have the peer relationships to know the reputation of certain kids or that certain kids tend to what we used to call come on to just about everybody. So they need to understand what is and isn't safe and what situations aren't safe. Now we're very used to the idea that going to a party at someone's home where parents aren't home or where there's drinking, that's unsafe. But it may be if a kid is vulnerable to wanting a relationship and someone's saying, I love you, or you do this and I will love you, the band room alone with someone might not be safe. So again, this is something that's nuanced and something that we have to help them think about. And again, those circles of relationships who do we feel safe with? Where do we feel safe with them? And something that's incredibly important is safe internet use, both in terms of chats, in terms of the people they may be relating to or connecting with, in terms of dating sites, but also safety in terms of their, their, their looking at information online, getting ideas about what's normal sexuality based on what they look at online. And they can even get in legal trouble. One of the um, books that I put down there is a book by Nick Durbin. It's a young man who at a very young age went, had a teacher say that homosexuality was a sin. And so he basically buried to the best of his degree, best of his ability, his concerns that maybe he was he was, um, he was gay. And as a young adult, he came back to visit this. And the way he sought information is he went online and he downloaded pornography. He downloaded a, a, porn a pornography that was straight. He porno downloaded pornography that was gay. And he downloaded child pornography, unwilling, un un unknowing that that is against the law. And believe it or not, the FBI can know if you're downloading child pornography. He was arrested, even though there were multiple experts that were testifying that he presented no risk. He was convicted and he's listed as a sex offender. So it's incredibly important we help our children understand what's safe internet use, what's safe to put out there on TikTok or Instagram or any of the places they may be. And that OAR site I shared with you has a lot on this. So what we're talking about here is not the act of sex. What we're talking about here is self-respect and self-esteem and relationships and safety. So the first thing that's important is that you be informed yourself, whether we agree or like or don't like, we do need to know the world that our children are navigating. And there is no way they're going to avoid this world no matter where they are, unless we keep them home all the time. And after this pandemic, I think we're all tired of being home all the time. You have to encourage your child to ask questions and you, you want to find out what your teenager knows. And again, this is something that you can do if you're watching a movie together, you're watching TV together, or something's in the paper. You can just say, oh, look, it mentions that. Do you know what that means? Unvalidate their questions. Whatever they're asking, say that's a good question. If by some chance you don't know the answer, be honest about that and say, let's learn together or to send them to a trusted adult who you feel comfortable answering their question. Help your child feel that it's safe to talk to somebody. It's safe to wonder. It's safe to ask questions. And it's safe to explore. Just because you hang out with girls and you're a girl does not mean you're a lesbian. Just because maybe you even have a fantasy about a girl during puberty when your hormones are all going doesn't mean that you're you're gay or a lesbian or a, or or um, 
some some other kind of gender or some other kind of attraction. It's normal to have different kinds of feelings. It's normal to have feelings change. So have honest discussions with your children and share information that's factual and logical. So that's why we have so many resources at the, at the end of this conversation. The point is that this is a long-term ongoing conversation that we want to start in very simple ways when they're young by talking about their bodies or perhaps talking about puberty because we want them to be we want to be them to feel it is safe and that they can talk to us or to some trusted adult so much of this is new to us and we don't need to know it all but we can learn with our kids to keep them safe and to keep them healthy. Thank you so much. There are resources here to things that I've been talking about, and you'll be able to access this through the SpedNet website. Okay, any questions? I'm sorry, I'm trying to get back to the beginning. Are there any questions? Uh, <clears throat> there is one question here. Okay. Um, she's wondering what we can expect in the psychosexual realm for kids as a result of the pandemic. I suspect there are lots of issues out there that aren't being identified because kids are home. Well, I, you know, I, that's a really complicated question. Um, I think that many kids have been turning to social media more and they may have um, been, uh, you know, looking at social media, communicating with their peers by social media. And I know many people have been allowing their children to spend more time on the um, <coughs> Media because that's the only way they've been able to get together with other kids. So that's one reason why it's so important to ask them, you know, to be aware of what's going on on social media with them, but also to talk with them about what kinds of things are people talking about, or if we're watching a TV show to, to find out. Sometimes kids, when they're by themselves, are wondering about themselves, they have more time to reflect, they have more time to think about their bodies, they have more time to think about what what kinds of feelings they have. So they may have questions that under normal circumstances, they didn't have time to even think about. So I think that what we want to understand is what have they been seeing? What have they been hearing? What have they been thinking? And again, not in a way where we are interrogating them, just organically as something comes up or as the, the, um, there's the opportunity to say, I, um, you know, gee, I wonder what you, you know, what, what do you think about that? And again, we really do need to be aware of what they're seeing on, on social media, what they're going to on the internet, and any kind of risks they're exposing themselves to on the internet. Um, yeah, that, I don't see any more questions, but uh, people could be typing. I've seen some people have dropped off. Or maybe another minute or so. Let's see if somebody, oh, somebody might be typing here. <clears throat> well, um, here's one um, just came in. How do you suggest handling a child with greater impulse control issues? Well, I, that's a really good question because as you can see, um, impulse control is, is very, is, is critical in terms of safety and is critical in terms of crossing boundaries. The whole idea of consent requires that you be able to stop and think and that you be able to stop an impulsive action whether it's hugging or whether it's touching and ask the person or think about what what it is you're doing 
So I think this is a discussion that we have to have when we talk about consent and talk about strategies. You know, I think that rather than blaming or criticizing kids who perhaps tend to have impulsive behaviors and simply saying, don't do that, or that's wrong, or, you know, we're, we're going to um, have some kind of uh, consequence if you do that. We need to help them think through what are strategies that I can use for myself that will help me stop and think. And it's going to be different for different people. I can't tell you one that works for everybody, but, you know, everything from breathing to counting to 10, to taking a walk or, you know, it's going to be different for different kids. It's what works for your kid, but that has to be included in the kinds of discussions we're having. The idea that other people have boundaries and these boundaries are really important, not just in the other ways that we're talking about, but specifically in terms of the language they're using, the kinds of ways they might be touching, the kinds of ways they might be doing something that could be interpreted as sexual. One of the things that can be very difficult to explain to kids is activities that they might do quite naively that can be experienced as problematic. For example, harassment is in the eye of the beholder so that the same act, uh, beha set of behaviors your child sees as okay when it's done by one kid, where somebody comes up from behind somebody and gives them a hug, for example, might not be okay and might be considered harassment if it's done by somebody, something somebody doesn't like or who, who doesn't like that person and doesn't want that action. I have one boy who, um, texted a girl 50 times because he felt if she wasn't getting back to him, she must not have gotten his texts. He was a very impulsive kid. He had very little patience. And one of the things that we had to talk about is how often is it okay to text somebody? And the kind of, the kind of idea that if you text somebody, you wait for a response. And if they don't get back to you, maybe they are making a choice not to get back to you. So the whole idea of what our kids are seeing and their impulsivity and having to interpret what's okay and not okay based on what they see other people doing is very complex. And I think it's really important to have open conversations about what goes into the sexual realm and strategies for ahead of time. So we have a couple more questions here. Uh, how do you address a child who is concrete and believes people online? If they say they're a 13 year old boy, then they must be. Online is the only form of communication right now, but puts them at risk. Is there a happy medium? Well, you know, I think we, one of the things that's helpful is that we try to teach our children to be conscious consumers of what they see and what they read of media in general. So um, realizing that a TV show or, an, or a YouTube site is actually trying to sell them something. And so the same way that we're giving them the information that this is, we have to be kind of thoughtful consumers of the information we're getting about what we should buy or what we should do or what we should wear or what we should try. We have to be thoughtful consumers about what people are telling us online and kind of connect the two because they do hear about being a thoughtful consumer in school or in other places. So we just extend that idea to online. It doesn't mean that everyone, everything is wrong, but it means we have, to be, we have to be thoughtful. We have to be kind of open to the idea that maybe this isn't, this isn't what's being said and always open to the realization that we have to be have those circles of intimacy in terms of who do you share what with? And that this person online, even though they may be talking to you, even they may, may uh, be telling you that they like you and they're your friend, let's go back to that circle and say, where is this person actually in terms of friendship? <clears throat> okay. Um, there's, uh, I have a seven-year-old son with Down syndrome and a minimal verbal communication but I see he's already curious about his body. 
Is there a recommendation for someone like him to help him through this process? Again, his verbal communication is minimum, but his understanding is greater. Well, uh, whatever way you're using to communicate with him and he's expressing his needs, it is probably the best way to do this too. And so it might be using pictures. It might be um, if he has some alternative nonverbal way of communicating, that certainly would, would be helpful. Um, you know, different kids who are not verbal communicate in different ways, but the same kinds of yeah, you know, the same kinds of things. And I think we don't, we, we want to not be embarrassed about sharing pictures and sharing ideas. Because remember the same way that we talked about words and our fear of words being something that we've learned, being fearful about showing our child about say his body and ideas about what is private and what is public. You can use that whiteboard. You can use the kinds of, you know, um, infographics that I used. And as you look at these materials, you'll see infographics. So hopefully those will be helpful. Uh, what advice do you have for a loving but naive young person who has no concept of the responsibilities that can result from sexual activity? I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that? If you mean that they're not aware of the fact in terms of their own safety and sexual health, I think it's very important to be pretty open about sexual health and the dangers of sexual activity. If you're talking about um, what we used to call, I remember, I didn't understand what first base and second base and third base was until I heard my daughter's friends explain it in the back seat when I was uh, driving them to a field trip. But if they're talking about sexual exploration, again, talking about what kinds of situations might they should might they feel safe in and what situations might be more cautious and kind of even you can even have a a system of green light yellow light red light and talking about what's a yellow light situation and why so you know there can be ways that we have that are shorthand for for talking about situations and you know, helping them if you're aware of what they're doing, kind of wondering with them. We, the same way that we use social stories, we might use stories to talk about what can happen and help them learn how to think. Really what we're doing as they're getting older is teaching them how do I think and how do I problem solve? Uh, here's a sort of the opposite. How will a child who has some sensory issues and the fear for contact successfully find intimacy when appropriate with a partner. They will doubtless get there on their own, but some but someday, but how do we let them know it's okay? Well, there's a difference between being okay and liking it. And I think one of the things that we need to remember is that our kids who have sensory issues genuinely do have those issues. And helping helping uh, with, with strategies that actually work for them. I, I'm working with a young woman right now who doesn't like touch. And one of the things that we have to talk about is, well, then how can you be close to somebody if touch is, is, is something that's actually physically unpleasant for her? And telling her, well, you have to just grin and bear it because this is what you've got to do is not going to lead to a successful intimate relationship. Similarly, she's very sensitive to smell. And so if somebody wants to come over and say, give her a kiss and they've just drunk coffee or they've just had something to eat, that's actually nauseating for her. So if she's going to be in an intimate relationship, one of the things she has to be clear about and that we're talking about is what are, what are her boundaries and what does she enjoy? What doesn't she enjoy? And, and have that be real for them. I think that there's a tendency to say, well, you, you know, you, you, you need to be able to do this. Well, maybe they do, but if it's unpleasant or actually physically distasteful to them, maybe they don't. Maybe they have to find another way that works with a partner. Uh, 
How do I address a susceptible child who changes their identity based on who they most recently hung out with or saw on TV rather than who seem to be authentic? I think one of the things that we need to do is to feel, you know, our kids go through stages. I remember that my daughter would be in a particular stage of development and whether it was being toilet trained or anything else, and I'd be going crazy. And just as I reached the point of total craziness, she went on to the next stage. And I think we can tell our kids that all of these things, sexual identity, sexual attraction, are things that evolve over time. And we have to give ourselves time. Exploring, having ideas, thinking, wondering, those are all normal, but we really don't work all this out for ourselves for, for quite a while. And we have to have different kinds of experiences over time before we really get an idea of what's right for us. And that might not be the, what your child wants to hear. They wanna say, no, I know this is it right now, but I think we really do need to say, hey, you're not, you're 13. You're not who you were when you're 10 and you're not who you're going to be when you're 16. We go through changes, our thoughts change, our feelings changes, and our feelings about ourselves change. Uh, what advice, uh, what do you advise a young person that has a dominant genetic disorder about sex? The focus of the session is about safety, but there's another dimension of consequences, namely pregnancy and the responsibilities of parenthood. Well, you know, obviously, when we're talking about sex, we're not leaving out where do babies come from. And I know that in a lot of schools, they have an exercise that they do where everybody's required to bring home a doll that's programmed to cry and to do other things and they have to keep it with them. I think in some cases it's a sack of flour actually, but they have to take care of it for a number of weeks and they learn kind of how difficult it is that a baby is not a doll that you play with, but these, you know, these things they bring home are programmed to cry at very inconvenient times. They can't leave them unless they find childcare. And so I think we have to talk to our kids about health and sexual health the same way as health and be very upfront and frank with them that just as right now, and actually the pandemic's a little helpful because if we're going to touch a doorknob, for example, we're touching everybody else who's touched that doorknob. And so if we're going to have intimate relationships with someone, in a way we're having intimate relationships with everyone they've had intimate relationships with. And so to protect our own sexual health, what do we need to do? And certainly in terms of the consequences, to be very, uh, be very frank about how kids get all kinds of stories. You can't get pregnant if it's the first time. You can't get pregnant if you just had your period. You can. And we need to dispel a lot of those myths and say different people have different timing. And, you know, yeah, and, you know, to just be very clear with them. The same way you'd be clear with them about any other issue that has to do with fundamental safety. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the well, chat or in the Q&A. Well, people certainly can be free to contact me if something comes up afterwards and they have a question. I think you have my contact information. Looks like there's one. Oh, more. there's one more that just popped in. Sorry. Yes, I said that, right? Uh, how do I help my autistic 12-year-old daughter di differentiate between a close friend versus love? That's a really interesting question because our autistic kids aren't necessarily picking up on the social cues that are um, that are the that are there. And to be honest, when you're dealing with um, sexual or or um, relationships or attraction between kids. It's confusing to kids and not just autistic kids as to what is and isn't love. And I think one of the things that, that I would do is talk about well, what is love and how do you treat someone you love? So I certainly encourage 
the child to look at behavior. Is this person behaving toward me in a way that's loving? Or is this person behaving toward me in a way that um, isn't taking my needs into account? I talk about love as something that, again, develops over time, that a really loving relationship is not something that happens at first sight, even though in the story, some people may fall in love at first sight. In reality, that's, that's not the way that works. And we talk about the difference between love and a crush. And so with, but with autistic kids, we've got to be very concrete. We have to be very clear and we have to understand that their questions are often going to need to be addressed very, very directly. So I would be very specific when you're, when you're talking about it and helping her differentiate with those circles, with, gra with, with diagrams, and with a, with a discussion of how, how even, even given the example of your own relationship, how long did it take you to know you were in love? Were there times when you thought you were in love and actually you were infatuated or in crush? Even helping your autistic kid learn that there are different words and love is one, but infatuation and crush and attraction are all different words that are a whole kind of a whole kind of range of feelings that we we might be going through. So just remember concrete literal and direct. Uh, <clears throat> many special needs children have genetic problems that are heritable. If they become parents, there are odds ranging from low to certain that their children will have the same disability that they have. What advice do you give about sex in this situation? Well, that, that's an incredibly complicated question question, and I might duck and say it's a little beyond the range of this talk. Obviously, if you're having that conversation, you're speaking to a young adult, and a young adult who's thinking about, about um, having a, a, a mar uh, some kind of relationship where they might be having children. And that's a conversation that I might encourage your young adult to have with a doctor or a genetic counselor as well as with a parent, because I don't know about your adult children, but my adult daughter doesn't always take my advice. And I can tell her I have a PhD in this stuff and that people come to me for advice and that doesn't matter in the slightest. So I think I, what I would recommend with someone like your daughter and or son and a partner is to sit down with a genetic with counselor or a doctor and to have this conversation and to talk through what their feelings are and what their, what their ideas are. Because I think that that's an incredibly individual decision. And it's one that would be, I'm assuming we're talking about adults here, something that's made by the adults involved. We can't tell them what to do even when we think we know what's best and they won't listen anyway. All right. I think just for the sake of time, if anybody needs to contact Dr. Eckert, she has her email. At the end of the slide, all the slides will be up on spednetwilton.org. And thank you so much for everything. Okay. Well, thank you all for- Thank you, Marsha. Great. You're welcome. All right. Thanks everybody for attending. Great. Bye-bye.